Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filstered make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Are you a professional looking for a reliable and high-quality rifle suppressor? Look no further than Primary Arms Government, whether you're equipping a team or shopping for your personal rifle. Primary Arms Government offers a complete selection of field-proven suppressors with options to fit any rifle and any budget. They work directly with the industry's leading brands to secure the best prices and available inventory, and their expert staff is always available to answer any questions you may have. Don't compromise on the safety and effectiveness of your equipment. Choose Primary Arms Government for all your suppressor needs. Visit them online today at Primary PrimaryArms.com slash government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry. Renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfair here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today's date is September 20th, 2023. The episode number is 356. We're going to be talking about defending against financial crimes. Now, there's a misconception that the focus of these, these crimes is primarily elderly people. And it's these old people that they get these calls from random people saying, hey, grandma, I'm in jail. Please bail me out. Yeah, those do occur. But it's not just the elderly that are being targeted. Everyone's getting targeted. And there is no avenue where you're safe. If you have any form of electronic communications device, there's the possibility you're going to get a text. You might get a phone call. You might get an email. You might get all kinds of things. There's the, the, the best defense is either completely unplug and live on an island somewhere where there's no mail or internet or be aware of methods and and be aware of some of the, the angles these people are taking to try to take advantage of you because that's what they're ultimately doing. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these crimes are uh, they're perpetrated and people aren't even aware of it until it's too late. And that is not just the elderly. Um, a couple weeks ago, I got a phone call. So I'm working graves. I usually sleep during the day. I got a call around noon from Wells Fargo and the phone that's Wells Fargo. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's someone saying, Hey, just so you know, uh, we, we saw that there's some fraudulent charges on your card. Like, oh, okay. Tell me what's going on. And they said, did you do that? Were you in this state and did you purchase this? No. Did you do this? No, 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 no. Then they started verifying info with me, which I thought, wait a minute, this isn't, this doesn't sound right. And then I said, um, let me call you back. Let me do some checks. And they're like, well, this, this is Wells Fargo though. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sure it is, but let me call you back. And then they're like, no, look at the phone number. Look, this is, this is clear. This is basically, they're saying, yeah, look, the phone number, this is Wells Fargo. It's not anyone else. 
Well, it just so happens it's possible to have phone numbers spoofed. This happens all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've gotten other phone calls from scammers and I wind up calling back and it's something com someone completely different. A lot of times I get uh, uh, scam calls from a local number and it's basically someone's copying or cloning or whatever the hell the, uh, the term is, uh, using that number that they're not actually behind, using that as kind of a mask to make this phone call. So that's what this scammer did. And then when I explained, look, I respond to these, I investigate these on a fairly regular basis. I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to call you back and then click. Um, and then I called up uh, Wells Fargo. I, I checked my accounts. Everything was fine. Called Wells Fargo on the, on the, on the number that actually it was the same number that they even called me from, but that was the spoof number. But uh, yeah, they verified. Yeah, there's nothing going on in your account. Like, okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure. And just, just so you know, there's a, someone's trying to scam, not that they can do anything about it. Um, so this kind of stuff happens on a regular basis. So we're going to discuss different methods of recognizing different methods that, that are being used to take advantage, take advantage of people. What are things that people can do? Have a, a, a panel that, that specialize in banky type stuff, investigative type stuff, uh, cybercrime type stuff, cybersecurity. It's going to be fun. Now, this is definitely different from our normal topics. Our normal topics are gun, gear, mindset, all that kind of stuff. Part of that mindset is security and financial security. Our personal information security is still, that's paramount. It's super important because if we let all that go, we've, we've let everything go. So it's going to be a cool discussion. We're going to go into backgrounds. Uh, so I've been doing the cop thing since uh, last century. I, I respond on a regular basis to incidents of various types of fraud. People get their a phone call or an email or whatever. And unfortunately, after it's too late, people realize, oh, that was a fraud. And then they contact us. And then we're like, sorry, be smart next time. Um, the best we can do is give them a case number and then uh, uh, relay them or uh, pass them on to the next federal agency, because most likely the crimes did not occur within our immediate jurisdiction or even in our state. So going up to a federal level seems to be the, the solution. And I don't know if anything ever happens from there. Jason. <clears throat> um, so before these guys give their backgrounds, uh, listen to who they are, who they represent, who they may um, support. And I'm going to say my favorite phrase, and that's support those sources that you found to be beneficial. Though this is a primarily a gun centric uh, uh, podcast, there are guns behind me. There might be guns in Lee's hand right now. The topic isn't necessarily about guns, but it's still going to get flagged. It's still going to be, it's still, it's, it's going to be squashed at its uh, distribution. And that's where you come in as the listener. So uh, like shares, subscriptions are always helpful. L pay attention to what these guys have to say. If you like what they have to say, try to find them on social media, give them a like, give them a follow. If they share something that's especially helpful to you, you might want to share, you might want to subscribe. Um, Going back to talking about how our, our influences are squashed, our uh, basically our ability to spread beyond our immediate borders is it's stopped by social media. I have uh, that on Instagram. Only my followers can see my Instagram posts, which kind of suck. So that's where you guys come in as the listener, or the viewer, and you can help expand that reach. So I think I'm going to pick on. Barry now for his background. What is this, your second or third episode? Or fourth or fifth that you've been oh, on? Oh, uh, I think just second. Okay. But it's been a long time. Yeah. It's been a long time. And you do some, you've done some wonderful reviews that unfortunately did not get any attention with some holsters that a lot of oh, people God. aren't fan to, fans of. We are not. I'm not a fan of them. And I, I think, think they, they have more fans than we realize because, uh, boy, they... The, those folks hate that route, those reviews. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm Barry. Um, I've been doing uh, financial crime stuff for going on just about 12 years now. Um, started out uh, just out of grad school. Um, and my first started out doing uh, correspondent banking stuff which is dealing with 
banks all around the world and their money laundering programs and and how they uh you know securing their access to the US financial system stuff like that um uh pretty much anything within financial security financial crime I've done uh, I'm a certified anti money laundering specialist I'm a certified financial crime specialist uh early next year I'll be getting a certified fraud examiner uh, certification also. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've done it all. We do, I do a lot of, you know, transaction monitoring, um, cybersecurity sort of roundabout way where, you know, we, we have to deal with, uh, you know, catching it on our side. So when folks call Matt, uh, we're the guys who, who get, uh, go and log into their accounts and, make sure everything's good and see who accessed it and where they were and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, spoiler alert there for Matt. I do work for Wells Fargo. Um, it's, it's not like it's on my LinkedIn profile, so it's not like a secret, but, um, yeah, so, uh, I've done it. Um, you know, like I said, for just over a decade now, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, the worst part is that, you know, just kind of like Matt's alluding to, it's, it's all reactionary. You know, we, we're always a step behind and, uh, as, as smart as we think we are, you know, if we were, if we were actually smarter than the bad guys, they wouldn't be around anymore, but they, they come up with new stuff every day and it's good, good for job security, I guess, but, uh, I don't know, maybe someday we'll get ahead of it. I'm not counting on it though. Yeah. Well, one of the benefits also of having you on is that all of a sudden now the Patreon subscribers are getting a special code for higher interest rates. <laughs> yep. Yep. We will charge you higher interest That's on your right. car loan now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you, you asked earlier, like, do we consider, like, do I consider myself a banker? And I tell people where I work and like, oh, is you're a banker. And I said, no, I just... I work near them. I'm yeah. not a I'm not a banker when the we have meetings and they talk about our earnings shares and dividends. I don't know what any of that stuff means. I'm like, you know, unless unless someone's laundering it, I don't doesn't doesn't bother me. I don't I don't know what it all means. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's important to have specialties and you have yeah. to have a a unique set of skills. Yes. Yes, for sure. So cool. Yeah, Lee, uh, I'm the only one on this panel who actually gets to be proactive about financial crime. So I'm just going to go ahead and flaunt that now. Uh, sorry, guys. My name is Lee. I run the page, the Obscene Sailor, been with primary and secondary for a little bit. I think it's been four since... years since my last. Uh, but um, And let's see here. Did you jump in with us in 15 or 16? 16. Okay. So right you're one of those. At... Yeah, right as the growth all started and uh, the standards dropped. Uh, yeah, that's right. Did about hey, class of 17, so what are you saying? Like, Oh, obviously. <laughs> I mean, Barry, we are the next generation. We are the retirement plan. Clearly, clearly. like that. I don't know how to break to him that he's never getting away from this. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I did 10 years in the Navy, worked joint uh, across the Fed side. My background is in cybersecurity anymore, though I am at a mid-sized credit, I mid-sized financial institution um, here in Arizona. My day job is all things cybersecurity plus the additional translation between folks who are in a, a slot like Barry, who they're maybe not necessarily cybersecurity focused, but they are crime, fraud, and bad focus there to provide a lot of the technical information to translate why things like user agent string matter when we're dealing with fraud so that's who i am stoked to be here gonna be a great time yeah jason uh i work for a small municipal agency i'm a sergeant in patrol now in uh just north of new orleans that's relevant to this episode i spent eight years assigning united states secret service uh, in New Orleans with the Louisiana. It's the Cyber Fraud Task Force now. Back when I was doing it, it was the Electronic and Financial Crimes Task Force. Uh, started off as a case agent uh, on the investigative side. 
uh, after about three years, moved into the digital forensic side also. So uh, I'm a phone examiner, Mac examiner, uh, network examiner. I uh, was a member of the pilot program that the Secret Service started in 2017 to do digital forensics on skimmers. Uh, so a lot of a lot of training in the digital forensics realm, but uh, still to this day dealing with actual casework and involving financial crimes, everything from business email compromise and uh, spam calls to uh, we've worked multi-million dollar multi-state credit card and money laundering rings, uh, business uh, uh, drawing a blank, network intrusions, uh, everything from the small mom and pop grocery stores and restaurants to uh, the city of New Orleans ransomware attack a couple of years ago. So, And that reminds me of a different one was the, are they called the skimmers where they basically had attached something to a card reader, like on a gas pump? Yep. Yeah. I forgot about those. And that, that in, in my town, that was uh, quite a big thing because there were a couple found and all of a sudden people became really paranoid, which they should be. But we started really talking about, okay, this, these are things to look at uh, before you're going to use a card reader. Look at these different things and okay. Is it, is it matching? Is, is the weathering accurate with the whole device or does it look, or do you have this one brand new thing and everything else is old? Um, yeah. Interesting. If there's a way to, to take advantage of others, people, uh, unscrupulous people are going to take advantage of it. Lee. Jason, I'm curious as you're, uh, as you're looking at skimmers and doing forensics on them, this is a hack RF with the Porter pack mod and it is effectively everything I need to do. Uh, entry level signals intelligence and electronic warfare. This is available from Amazon, which is where I bought it from, for about 200 bucks. There's work required, but it is, to me, indicative of proliferation of gray market electronic warfare and technical capabilities coming from the People's Republic. Does that match what you're seeing on the skimmer side? I, I, were you able to determine source countries or anything that you could share in that regard? Uh, yeah, m most of it was actually just uh, Bluetooth enabled microprocessor chipboards that were wired in line to the gas, the actual gas pumps. They would they would pose as a technician. Uh, you can get it. keys are rail, readily available to gas pumps. They would open the pump plug the skimmer in line. Uh, we would first, we started out years ago, manually checking gas pumps. Then we found out that we figured that they were wiring them up to where they were receiving constant power and always transmitting a Bluetooth signal so that they could pull up to a different pump, act like they were pumping gas, have somebody in the back on a laptop hook up via Bluetooth and exfil credit card numbers that way. Uh, so the technology is actually pretty basic and rudimentary. That's that's cool to know. It's scary at the same time. Yeah, it's it's not it's not brain surgeon level stuff. It's very very basic, very rudimentary. Uh, you know, it's it's basically uh, off the shelf. What bought in the wall bought in Walgreens uh flip phones that they're taking apart and modifying to store simple data. Yeah. Uh, I remember hearing a couple reports of and I don't remember what the outcome of the case was, but I remember reports of suspects being potentially employees of convenience stores and they would swap out the 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 in-store uh, card swipers. I thought, holy crap, that's Especially yes, interesting. We did we did find a few uh, in store overlays. Those were were more rare. We most of the overlays we saw were on Diebold ATM machines. Those were the most common. Uh, but then the gas pump ones were pretty pro prolific in the New Orleans metro area. 
because they're so easy to hide. And some of these gas stations in the Metro New Orleans area along I-10 are so busy that there's just no way to monitor them. And they, the employees don't care. They're And even if they do care, they, they can't keep up with it. They're so busy. So other than keeping an eye on your accounts constantly and keeping track of all of this and keeping track of your transactions, what are some things that someone can do to ensure or at least put forth a little effort to av- avoid that kind of a scam? Skimmers are basically what they are. Uh, if you're going to use an ATM, use an internal ATM. Uh Drive up and walk up ATMs are obviously going to be way more vulnerable than going inside the, the actual institution. Uh, gas pump skimmers, there's no way for an, the average person to know if there's a skimmer in the gas pump or not. Uh, so what we would tell people and what I do personally is I use a credit card. If if they get my credit card number, it's not my money. Mm. It's the bank's money. So uh, now that's an extra account that you have to monitor, which could be slightly inconvenient, but most banking apps nowadays, you can set up notifications for a purchase as small as $2.50. So you'll get a pop-up alert on your phone every time your card gets dinged. Uh, But the big thing, yeah, or on your watch. Yep. The big thing is just to use a credit card instead of a debit card or use Apple Pay or Android Pay because what you're actually transmitting is an encrypted tokenized version of your card number and not your actual card number. So it won't get compromised. Uh, This is my solution to that problem. Uh, 2019, 2020 on through COVID, I couldn't make it three months without getting my debit card stolen, predominantly off gas skimmers. Um, Anecdotal being what it is, here in Arizona, we have definitely had more skimmers in rural areas. Um, But I couldn't make it three months without my card getting stolen. Text notifications to my watch to reduce mean time to detection is the cybersecurity concept behind all of it. We need to know immediately because the quicker we know, the quicker we can react. There, it, there will absolutely be digital forensics and actions that you can take if you're more immediately responding. If they are stealing your card and buying from Walmart, I, I've had that happen, and they were getting a delivery from Walmart to their personal home. If you know about it beforehand, you have so many more options. The other thing is to insulate yourself as much as you can. So Apple gets a credit card in my name and there's more fraud that gets logged to that, uh, to that account than anything else, because the only thing I use it for is gas pumps. So this is, this is a topic I'm not that overly familiar with. Does this also include the, I don't even know what it's called, the, the proximity chip. NFC or NFC, RFID. Yeah. It can, depending on the product. I, Jeez, it, yeah. it de- oh, go ahead, Lee. Oh, no. Um. So the actual, hold on, I've actually got a bunch of them that I've lost in the ADHD. That you've stolen. Well, I, hey, 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 hey. Amazon <laughs> takes care of me. Bezos knows what I need. Um. These are NFC tags. Um, little RFID that are programmable. Mm-hmm. Touch it against your phone and it will automate a response to whatever it is that you want to do. All of the power for this comes from the transmitting and reading station. It is all powered over, over the air. So it's going to depend a lot on the specifics of NFC, which version um, RFID ambient conditions, what kind of wallet is your stuff in, um, as well as just the chips themselves. It depends. Interesting. What do you have for us, Barry? Uh, this is just it, the, the technical stuff is just uh, yeah. outside. Like I, 
I have no idea. Like it's, uh, I mean, I know I, I'm saying credit card for, for things like gas, because I know that that's where it's going to get swiped. I've had debit cards get compromised and it just takes forever. And credit card, if it, if something happens, yeah. I mean, I just call them up and it's canceled five minutes later and they send me a new one, but oh, to, to think that it's just that easy that, uh, you know, so, and I was actually going to say, Jason, when you're, you're saying that they're hooking these up in line, so they're opening the pump and putting it inside. They are. So the, oh. the old trick of, yeah, like wiggling the card reader. Not going to work on it. Not going to work on a gas pump. Gas yeah. pump skimmers are complete. No. So, so the technology <laughs> behind the gas pump skimmer is not only do they run a module to the actual card reader, they run a module to the keypad. So when capture they the capture pin. your card data, they capture either your PIN or your zip code zip also. Code. Uh, and we, we've seen that with ATM skimmers also. We've seen concealed cameras over the keypad so that they can catch your PIN as you input your PIN. So, uh, but to, to kind of follow up on what Lee was saying about the uh, the RF it's my understanding that the the tap to pay technology with cards, it's that is not a tokenized version of your card that's actually transmitting your actual credit card numbers. Now the good news is it's not running through a skimmer, so there are. I'm not going to say there's there's no chance that somebody has probably figured it out, but that's not something that we've run into yet. Yeah. where they've been able to compromise uh, those cards through the touch uh, tap to pay. And the reason why there's a little bit of a delay when if you use Apple Pay or Android Pay is because every time you use Apple Pay, that token is randomized. And Apple actually has to transmit it to the vendor or, or whoever the vendor's POS mer service is so that it meets up in the middle, right? So it's like a handshake. So the card is is not powered, obviously. So there's no way for it to transmit the token key. So there's no way for that handshake to, to work. And for people following along, POS is point of sale, not piece of shit, just so you know. That depends. Unless yeah, it's still true. your card. Yeah. 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 That, it's that's both. Actually... Yeah, that's actually a point, you know, speaking of, you know, preventing some of this stuff is for folks who are, you know, business owners, small business owners, if you own that gas station or you own that, you know, whatever shop in town, uh, update your POS, update your card readers, uh, because I know, you know, for for the the credit card companies, the the banks, if you're just doing the old swipe or typing in card numbers, if you get hit with fraud on that card, the credit card companies are not going to reimburse you anymore. Uh, if that card has you know the 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 chip or the the tap pay, uh, because basically they're saying that you've chosen to skip two security measures and swipe it. And so you're you're on your own. Um, so if you're in that position, those machines are not terribly expensive. Um, and if you get hit one time, it, it you know twice what it would have cost you to replace the little the little pin pad. So do it. Let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit from a business owner perspective. Um, that it, it is one that I think for our audience, I think about friends like Ike of Big Techs, who is not technical, who is not a cybersecurity guy. He's just our homie who's trying to sell He's not stuff. that bright. Is that what you're saying? I, he's real pretty. <laughs> he has some redeeming features. But nice hair. He's yeah, in candy. I, yes, yes. He, he, he's <laughs> giving me a run for the hair. Uh, if you are in a position like that, from the bottom of my heart, retain skilled advisors. Um, mm. MS, I, I, service providers of and take your take your pick of the acronym of the day, but a managed service service provider who is going to 
patch your point of sale system to is going to make sure that you're in compliance. The, the reality, the, the reason Matt is paying our exorbitant uh, hourly rates right now is there is a certain level of technical information that you just kind of need to be able to function in this realm. If you don't have it, it's just a matter of time until you get it. It's just a matter of time until something that, right, wrong, or indifferent, the credit card companies or your customers say that you should have been doing is going to is going to happen. You will save money paying for skill set in advance to get your setup right and then to do maintenance on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the common things that we would run into on the the breach side, the the data breach side, especially with the small mom and pop locations, be it restaurants or uh, gas stations would be that they would be running multiple POS terminals and then they would have a back of house computer system in the back that they were using for all of their business and then they would park their kids on it or they would park on it and they would run email, personal and business uh, and just general Com general com non-business computer usage uh, and it would open them up to all kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, several times we saw where they received some sort of bunk phishing email that had a malicious attachment that they thought was an invoice from a vendor that they were using. They open it up and it starts exfilling cards. And next thing you know, we start we we had a very good uh have a very good working relationship here in the New Orleans metro area with an organization called MOPSO, which is the Metro Orleans Bank Security Association. And it is the the vice presidents of security and investigation for just about every financial institution in the New Orleans metro area. They meet monthly, there's an email list. Uh, we worked very closely with them, and they were awesome at doing the analytics for us and pointing us towards a point of compromise. And 99% of the time when the point of compromise was a small mom and pop business, it was related to a back of the house computer being used for multiple tasks instead of being set aside strictly and solely to operate the point of sale system. So, but, and like Lee was saying, so so for a business owner, spend the money on the front end, get you a dedicated system that is only for point of sale, password protected, restrict access, and you know, don't park your kids on it. Don't play. Use a different system for email and regular business. A couple on that, um, Jason, and I'm a little curious. Was that APT driven, or was that more financial uh, financial crimes? On my side, we kind of have two separate tracks. One being very cybersecurity focused, brute forcing login attempts, um, kind of standard web attack stuff, and then we have the fraud side, which is me calling Matt trying to extort twenty bucks out of them. Yes. Yeah, so, so as a as an investigative unit, we worked them kind of all together. We didn't we didn't really differentiate. Uh, most of our most of our investigators became examiners also, just because it was it it was more conducive to kind of our operational level that to have multiple examiners on a scene uh, having investigated have an investigative background kind of knowing what you're looking for on the technical side helped a tremendous amount uh so it, it was we were multi-disciplined we never didn't really separate it uh we did have some guys that had migrated strictly to the digital side uh but most of the guys did it did it all I, what was your what was your percentage 
um, and and feel free to break it down along either metric. But between cybersecurity and fraud, what what was your breakdown? 50, 50, 75, 20? Uh, we we were we were probably 75, 25 uh, on actual work and fraud cases, not so much on the cybersecurity side, unless it was like a, a network intrusion uh, mitigation type plan after we conducted an investigation. But but we would always uh, refer them out to you know a private entity. We would recommend, okay, these are the steps you need to take. This is how you got compromised, you know, and then we would we would guide them to to bring somebody in uh, from the private sector to get them set up with what they needed. Something Lee said reminded me of uh, something that we've dealt with a lot, but it seems to have decreased a little. Talking about that Walmart order that you didn't place and it's sent to an address. Having responded to multiple of these addresses, there was a commonality with the, the people that we were in contact with. Number one, they claimed that they had no idea. Number two, I don't know if they were tech savvy enough to do this themselves. Number three, they all pretty much said, you know, I took, a, I took out a, or I, I picked up an ad saying, make a lot of money, stay at home. And ultimately all they do is they, they receive packages and send them off and that's all they do. And I thought that was really interesting. Now I haven't seen the ads for those types of jobs in a while now. Um, I, they, they, they might still be something big elsewhere, but where I live, haven't really seen anything about it and haven't seen advertisements for them, but that definitely did seem to be a common factor that there were people unknowingly part of uh, basically a web of uh what do you even call it it's a product yeah. laundering yeah we call we call them reshipper schemes. yeah yeah and I, ironically a lot of those reshippers are actually victims themselves so most reshippers only last for a week or two because mm -hmm. the first check they get is actually a counterfeit check yeah so they they deposit it or cash it, it clears. So it, it's a, and, and there's a, a, have to make a distinction. It's not a counterfeit check insofar as a completely fake check. It's, it's a legit check. Uh, it's got a legit routing number. It's got a legit account number. Just the title on the check is not the right company. So initially, it will, some of the funds will be made available. So they go on a spending spree. And then seven to 10 business days later, their bank notifies them that, oh, hey, this check got sent back, uh, stamped, counterfeit. And then they're also out. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, and it's yeah. just like, and, and this is, a, this is a, the kind of case I haven't taken in a bunch of years. Um, Facebook personal ads or Facebook uh, marketplace. Uh, someone has a wedding dress for sale. They get an email from someone in another country saying, Hey, I really want to buy that. They send the money and you know what? The check, I was only asking for 700 bucks. They sent me 2000 and they said, keep the additional three, but send me, send me the difference. And what do you know? The check also it's fraudulent yep. and then they're they end up holding the bag or they but, ask you to forward or or get get a money order for the difference and send it to my yeah. cousin in in yeah. kenosha wisconsin yeah 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 we've seen that quite a bit also and and it's i, I don't know jason you may have a better idea of how many steps occur before it finally reaches the final destination um but I can't imagine it's only one. I can't uh, imagine it's, it's yeah, it's 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 never three or four. It's it's sometimes close to a dozen. That it it's it's almost exhaustive. Uh, you, you try and run it down, and even if you can run it down, uh, you start dealing with multiple agencies, multiple jurisdictions. You know, even as a task force, we would reach out to field offices 
uh, across the country. And, you know, they're just as swamped as we are. They're working just as many cases as we are. By the time they get out there, it's a month later, two months later, you know, and either the the reshipper number five is gone or doesn't want to cooperate or is over it or just doesn't remember a whole lot of details, you know, uh, and who knows where the, the actual wedding dress show ends up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And who uh, cares? It might yeah, go down. yeah. Yeah. But you have a trail of people, you know, who are out thousands of dollars. You know, it's it, at the end of the day, what I tell people about financial crimes is if it if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. You know, you need to set your emotions aside and think a little bit. Yeah, you but know, like you like you did, call call your bank back. You know, your bank is not going to call you and ask you to verify. They're not going to call you and ask you what your account number is. If they're your bank, they know what your account number is. You know, it, it's it's actually uh, simple to prevent looking at it from the outside, but these these perpetrators have become experts in preying on people's emotions that's why we see uh the grandson in jail uh the virtual kidnappings the uh the power company calls to the businesses you know uh i had a, a friend of mine that uh he's his family owns several of some of the most popular restaurants in the new orleans metro area uh McDonald's. He's a huge supporter of law enforcement. We love him. We're always there. He supports our FOP tremendously. And he fell victim to a power company scam because they called his restaurant at 1030 in the morning. He was opening for 11 on a Friday, his busiest day of the week. And they told him that this was Entergy and your bill is past due. You owe us $550. You need to go get a Green Dot gift card and pay us over the phone right now, or we're going to shut your power off. So he ran down the street, got a Green Dot gift card, paid him, hung up the phone, asked his general manager, hey, I just had to pay the power bill. What's going on? And she was like, the power bill has been has been paid. Who did you talk to? And he said, I talked to Energy. And she said, well, we don't even have Entergy. We have Clico. But he was so worried about his business being shut down a half hour before the lunch rush, it didn't even register. Not to mention the fact that they're going to call and only accept payment by Green Dot gift card. Yeah. Hey, so, just so you know, you just won something. You need to pay us the taxes on it first before you. Yes. Get it yeah, exactly. But they 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 prey on people's emotions and they prey on people's ignorance. Yeah. You know, uh, and at the end of the day, education is is the best prevention. You know, most people just don't understand how these these schemes and scams work. You know, it's one thing. Skimmers are one thing, you know, especially gas pump skimmers. That's the average person. They're not going to take apart gas pumps. And obviously we got you got to get gas. But a lot of these these phone calls, these email compromises. Just an extra 10, 15 seconds, an extra click here, an extra click there. Take and, a breath and think. Yes, absolutely. Uh you know, you were talking about how uh, you got your call. Well, I've been getting a lot of uh, FirstNet past due notices via text and email. Uh, and I was, look, I'm human every now and then. I get distracted, you know, between doing doing the dad thing and working and, and trying to make it to jujitsu a couple of times a week. And all week, I forget to pay my AT&T bill. It happens. But I don't forget to pay it every two weeks or every week. 
you know, and you get these these emails. And first of all, I wasn't even aware that AT&T had gotten hacked until I, I took a second and Googled it. And actually, I, I think it was in the end of March or beginning of April of this year, uh, they had a data breach of, of eight to 10 million customers. Wow. Including FirstNet, which is all first responders. You know, uh, so can, all can can we expand out from that breach? Because there there are some technical details to breaches that have follow on compromise impact. Yeah, definitely. Your AT and T account for me, uh, my last was PlayStation. Your AT and T account, your username or your email address, your password, phone number possibly home address possibly backups i'd like Naked backup contact you well i hey hey that's only me and don't worry i send them the link in advance they know what they're getting into um the uh the problem is all of that data is really really weaponizable so jason being the good upstanding uh, american that he is we see the safe in the background Let's pretend for a second that his password for his AT&T account is something gun-related. Proliferation of AI ML models means that bulk analysis of a password breach is not actually hard to do. And I can correlate Jason, his user account, his phone number, all of which is tied to every other account that he has. And if I look at his password and go, oh, hey, that's that's related to... New Orleans sports team or a hobby or an interest. All of his passwords are shooting related. They're all derivatives of block. Well, I just cut the possible number of passwords that I need to guess from trillions to a couple thousand. Is it Glock one, two, three, four or Glock exclamation point one, two, three, four. Good passwords and tiered passwords are critical because that and rotations be, i don't actually agree with rotations. oh not rotations today. but changing on a regular basis i yeah not actually today super important um that that stems from a very long time ago where replication wasn't necessarily the, the easiest thing um and computer networks just looked different today if you have a good password that isn't known compromise as long as you're not using it anywhere else, you're kind of okay. So what you're saying is don't use QWERTY, which Q-W-E-R-T-Y, oh, that's a very widely used password, believe it or not. Don't use it for everything. Just use it for the most important things. I ate the, the most important sarcasm. things. Um, additionally, MFA is the thing to really look at. So we've got two options here phone, those SMS text messages that we all get and that our federal employee friends hate because it means that they cannot get into their Gmail account while they're at work to the phone. And that is the most common MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication. This is a really, really good stand-in. This is from Token2. It is NFC programmable set up for all of the accounts that I care about with a three-year battery life, no requirement for any outside connection. All it does is takes the encryption protocol. I bury yes as well. The only difference is this one is set up for multiples. So I could have Facebook, Gmail, um, but it, it's the same concept. MFA, no one's ever going to ask for your code. No one... It, your bank does not need your second factor of authentication to confirm that you are who you are, no matter what they say. But it's to the point my financial institution that I use for my banking is actually including on every single text, we will not ask you for this number. Yep. Yeah, and that's the thing. Um, some newer, you know, ATM access for people, uh, you don't need your card anymore. You just basically walk up to the machine you use your phone to log in. It sends you a token, a code to use, and then that's the that's the what you use for the pin to get into the ATM. So, yeah, that's just another extra layer of security because you don't 
you don't know that your pin. You're not just plugging your card in and typing it. They've got to send you a new one every single time. So that helps <laughs> a little bit. The, the real root of what I'm trying to get at here is you need to understand the, the ways that your data can be used against you. Yeah. So uh, it just like we would worry about uh, somebody gaining limb control in VJJ, we need to worry about our passwords getting compromised. Um, we need to be using a good password manager and we need to track in a way that the average consumer just hasn't had to who our critical service providers are and what their cybersecurity capabilities are. Um, be it for I be it from a fraud perspective to isolate and target people who are scamming, or from a cybersecurity perspective to keep the next PlayStation Network hack from happening. Yeah, easily accessible information should not be part of your security system. My son's, my my wife's, my daughter's birthdays shouldn't be a key code to get into my garage, to get into my ATM, or to get what it has to be something completely different. Um yeah, and don't so, use the same code across the board. Jason. So so back in the, the good old days before we had uh, really cool toys to break into phones, we did for about six months, did a, a rolling tally of phone passcodes of just kind of just a, a, a general anecdotal study of people that gave us consent to access their phones and provided passcodes. What was the passcode? And so, uh, you know, what was the passcode? Was it a date of birth? You know, but most of the time it's a date of birth. It's an anniversary. It's a date of significance yeah. in that person's life. It's a child's birth date, a uh, child's birth date backwards. It's a birthday, a uh, birthday backwards. It's the last four or last four or last six of your social backwards or the first six of your social scrambled uh then once we got our hands on some of the advanced tools to break into the phones we were actually able to develop word lists of these passcodes to inject into the phone first before it started running its actual brute force attack of its just general zero 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 one and we were pretty successful with giving it dates to scramble and inject into that device first before it ran its full uh, number list. And it, it worked a lot of the time. Uh, to kind of follow up with what Lee was saying about passwords and complexities and stuff, we we used to crack... Uh, iCloud keychain passwords uh, by running word lists against them all the time. And it it doesn't take a super powerful system. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. Uh, I would typically, if I had a, a keychain that I had to crack, I would typically set it up on a Friday around lunchtime. I would grab a, my biggest word list that I had on my my MacBook Pro that it was a 2017 MacBook Pro that was issued to us by Secret Service. And I would just set it up and let it run. And more often than not, when I came in Monday morning, the iCloud uh, keychain had been cracked and I was in. Yeah, so password complexity, length and complexity is your friend. Uh, you know, 12, 16, you know, 18, 24, alphanumeric symbolic combinations, you know, uh, especially randomized, it will take millions of years to try and break that password. Now, it's it's a pain in the neck to remember them, but, uh, you know, I, I'm an iPhone user. I've the 
Apple iOS has a great uh, built-in feature for randomized passwords. You know, it seems to seems to work pretty good. And if you're a if you live and breathe in the Apple ecosystem, then you can share those passwords across multiple platforms as long as they're they're Apple platforms, and there is no remembering of any passwords. Good yeah. Stuff. Uh, speaking of you know complexity of passwords, things like that. Um, I, I had experience here recently where organization they were requiring uh, now a 16 digit 16 character password, which is great. They wanted uppercase and lowercase and symbols and numbers and everything mixed in there and no no words. So you couldn't have like specific words that it recognized. I live on the border. Um, Spanish is first language for a lot of people, and the system would not recognize Spanish words as words, uh, which, I mean, I know that that's just a whole other layer of, of thing because you gotta, you can't always account for, you know, a thousand different languages, obviously. But th that was it. Just came to mind because here, you know, where I am, uh, Spanish is just it's it's as common if not more common than english and so the fact that yeah i can't you know put the dog but i can put el perro and it's fine you know <laughs> yeah there's one aspect to this as well um putting some of this together even even an account that you don't care that much about is going to have information most likely is going to have some form of information about you and that's going to be the first step to get deeper and deeper. So we could log on to, so I'm a, I'm a good example of this. Go on to Facebook, look up my profile. You're probably gonna find out information about me. Now, fortunately, my passwords aren't related to anything, as of right now, uh, not related to anything that I have security-wise. None of my passwords are related to any anything that we've discussed. Um, but the common person, it probably is. So if we're looking up rando on Facebook, we go to their, we go to their profile, and we can go, we can just look through and go, okay, well, here, here's a tidbit, here's a tidbit, here's a tidbit. Go, now let's jump over to this, this different place. Here's their YouTube. Okay, what are some of the things here? Eventually, unless you're doing as what these guys are saying and having something randomized with a lot of, with random characters, you're going to be opening yourself up. Uh, and... Understanding your, your threat profile, understanding the things that are likely to get lobbed against you. The four of us here, we've got Matt, who owns a successful digital content brand. Reasonably successful. We like you well enough. Uh, you've got myself in the IT world. You've got Jason, who is cleared, you know, uh, special access. And Barry, who is the same for a corporate entity. He also does Fallon impressions. Oh, that is. <laughs> Ooh. You can rent them oh, for parties. <laughs> Pay up. That's it. <laughs> do we get to break you like you're Fallon, or do we have to just keep that internally? Uh, it's uh, it's an all-inclusive package. Yeah. Bring it. Tru <laughs> truly the customer <laughs> service we need. Um, <laughs> there's a fundamental difference threat profile um there's there was a school district here locally that was hit with ransomware uh taken offline for weeks as they were negotiating with the ransomware attackers and the initial compromise came from a printer driver that was being hosted on a water wow. hole for system admins wow um yeah i yes yes exactly matt but it, it was a clever attack because they were posting their malware on a website that only system administrators are interested in. Because who else cares about a printer driver from 10 years ago? It is the same across the entirety of the internet right now. There is a huge spat of free freeware that is entirely meant just to compromise your device so that follow-on attacks against 
anything corporate you have, anything valuable that you have. If you have an Azure instance where you're running your cloud hosting for your website, they're they're pulling that password and they're trying to log in. Um, there is a threat profile that is more than just the money in your bank account. Everything is not just valuable, everything is attackable. Because if I gain access to primary and secondary across all of its social media platforms, I can rename it. And that page, just by virtue of having followers, has a financial value to it. Well, how many of our friends have had that happen to their own personal accounts on Facebook? That happened to me while I was in the middle of moving. It is a common thing, and there's zero infrastructure. There's zero requirements for the initial setup. It's not like I'm setting up a brute force rig like what Jason's talking about to, to try password after password after password. I'm literally just in the web UI copying things that are publicly available to repost them. I have a cousin who I don't think is overly tech savvy whose uh, profile picture changed from a picture of her to some random guy. And then I started looking for, wait a minute, this isn't. And clearly her account got hacked and it was being taken over by some random person. Well, what happens when you take over someone's account? You have access to all of their friends' information. And so if you have your account closed, but it's open to friends, now your information is open to this, this, this person who just took over and now they have information about you. So your, yeah. your own personal security is dependent on others as well. Yeah, I, I mean, you've probably seen recently there's all those, you know, found injured dog posts on Facebook and, you know, it pops up and you know, it's it, it's a scam. And it's it's one of these things where they're not trying to take over your account necessarily, but what they want you to do is share the post and then, you know, the post gets changed and becomes something else and it has a phone number to call for a great deal on rent on this apartment. And your friends see it and think, well, Matt posted it. It's, it must be okay. Legit, Matt's a smart yeah. guy. Uh, yeah. And so they start, you know, they start, you know, they, they fall into that by virtue of just kind of trusting what they see from their friends yeah. or family, whoever it happens to be. And that's, that's become a big thing. I mean, I see those stupid things every day. It's ridiculous. I don't think I've seen any. What's no. like the, uh, the, 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 re uh p copy paste and share of what was your first car what's yeah yes yeah. those it's, it's yeah every every common security question yeah that <laughs> yes. people, i mean it's uh, again it's it's a lot of this stuff is not rocket surgery it may be brain science but it's not rocket That's surgery right. you know you people just need to think yeah. Just a little bit, you know, uh, getting back to the emails real quick. One one big thing, these emails that we're seeing from all of these hacked businesses, they they have real websites. They have yes. fantastic emails that look authentic. What they don't have is an at at dot com email address. And that's what the, the simplest thing to do is click on the actual sender's information. Yeah. Because I can I can make my email system tell you that the email is from anybody I want it to. Yeah. But when you clickety click on that actual sender's email address, it will show you username at domain and if you're getting an email from AT&T telling you that your bill is passed due and the domain is att.coolkidclub.whatever.com oh that's from me it's probably not AT&T yeah I read a really interesting report about uh, a similar scam where they wound up using a uh, uh, 
one letter from the, I think it was Cyrillic alphabet, where it looks, yep. if you're not paying attention. Very similar. Yep. It's, yep. Yeah, it, but it's yep. just different enough. Very interesting. Genius. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I, I, there were a lot of interviews that we did that left me telling these guys, you know, if you spent half as much time trying to be a legit citizen as you did being a crook, everybody that you have talked to today would be working for you. Yeah. You know, these guys are, they're, they're very innovative. They're, they're very intelligent. They come up with just crazy stuff. Yep. Uh, but then at the same time, I've seen some really dumb stuff too. Yes, yes. You know? Those are typically uh, the ones we catch right away. I've, I've yep. seen counterfeit platinum credit cards uh, several times when we were in, we, we spent six, eight years investigating a large multi-state uh, credit card fraud ring, a uh, multi-million dollar a year operation. The guy was actually hiring hackers uh, to hack credit card numbers. And then he was hiring Smurfs to go out and buy gift cards with the cloned credit cards. They were shipping the credit cards into New Orleans and laundering them through a grocery in uh, the French Quarter that actually had a dedicated point of sale terminal in the back that all he did was bang these counterfeit cards when the when they came in. Uh, and the guy that was running the ring, uh, he he was a street hustler back in the day, but he was never a real tough guy. Uh, but he would hire legit New Orleans brand killers to protect it. Uh, and he would fly these guys to Houston where he was living for the weekend where you go partying and they would be there, his muscle and they would fly back with their payment. And he, he would pay them in a stack of counterfeit credit cards. And these guys were so dumb that they would carry them in their pockets through TSA. Yeah. So it was, there were a lot of, Sundays and Mondays when the detail guys at the New Orleans International Airport would call some of the Jefferson Parish guys that were on the task force with us like, hey, uh, we just got a call from TSA. They got a dude flying in from Houston. He's got 300 counterfeit credit cards in his pocket. You know, so they're they're as as dangerous and, and savage as a lot of these guys were. Uh, they, they definitely weren't smart. Uh, but Working the street level stuff, you know, in the the 2000 teens, most of these guys in New Orleans that were doing this street level stuff were veterans of the crack war. You know, so they were not, you know, just little nerds that always did financial crimes. I mean, these were guys that had murders, attempted murders, you know, uh, armed robberies. Several of the guys that we had uh because small time possession cases on uh went down in new orleans for multiple multiple murders uh we actually we had a couple of paid informants in this ring and one of the guys that we had particular interest in we were we were trying to get the ci uh to provide information on him and the CI was adamant. He was like, there, there's no way that guy is, he's crazy. You know, he, he will literally cut your head off and set you on fire. You know, he's, nobody's going to mess with him. You know, we just kind of, all right, whatever, you know, the streets have opinions of certain people. Well, about three months later, he legitimately went to jail for a double homicide where he cut a couple's head off both of their heads off, stuffed them in the trunk and set their car on fire. Yeah. So it, it, the, the New Orleans financial crime scene was a little interesting uh, pre pandemic with yeah. the, the level of, of stuff that we were seeing and the, just the players that were involved. Uh, 
we had a lot of homeless check cashing rings. I don't know if that's that's something Matt that you guys have seen. No. Uh, you know, obviously New Orleans metro area has got a bunch of homeless guys, a uh, lot of homeless. And what they would actually do was they would come in and they would recruit uh, homeless guys that had you you had to have a valid driver's license. That was the rule. Uh, they would typically swing through Monday or Tuesday and identify guys that had IDs. They would come back through on a Thursday. They would pick them up and take them to Goodwill, buy them some decent looking clothes, take them to a hotel, shower them up, shave them. And Friday morning, first thing, they would go out with counterfeit checks, you know, anywhere between twenty five hundred and probably forty five hundred dollars. And the initial arrangement was always uh ten percent. We'll give you guys ten percent. Most of the time they got a happy meal and then arrested. Yeah. Uh they would they would burn them pretty quick. But we we were inundated with those for it, it seems like we had a ring come through once every two weeks for about two and a half, three years just absolutely slaughtering us with that those is, cashers. I, I'm a little curious. That sounds similar to the pill mill methodology out here. Did that match what you guys were having on the prescription? Uh, it, was, it, it was a very, yeah, it was a very similar, very similar scheme, very similar MO. I, yeah curious if the methodology transferred over because that is on the fraud side we're seeing methodology cross from both directions to target people in new ways so oh uh, definitely a little curious as to what uh what normal looks like beforehand well it, it sounds like the the criminal element is going where the money is and if that's your business that makes sense um well and a, a lot of the guys would say that 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 you know I was told numerous times nobody gets shot on the side of the road over a check. You know, and and the other thing that they used to tell me is y'all are the only ones that care about financial crimes. The victims don't care. The banks don't care. You know, we don't care. The Very judge cares. don't care. The, the judge don't care. Yeah. Uh we had guys getting they're on three and four different probation cases before they do a day in jail for a bank fraud case yeah no uh that was the the frustrating that's the frustrating part about it is seeing yeah. these mul multiple offenders and and seeing the the homeless that are down truly down on their luck that are just trying to make a quick buck that don't necessarily know they'll they probably should know but they they don't know the depth of the scheme that they're involved in. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a pattern here because anyone that attempts to help them, whether it be that the, the victim thinks that they're, they're going to benefit because we're doing business or I'm going to, I'm going to get 10% or you name it. The consistency here is they're all getting screwed and that makes no sense to give in, which brings me to my next question or my next topic. And it's about ransom accounts or account ransoming. How much do you, Barry, do you ever have to deal with that? Um, I haven't personally. Um, I know, uh, I can't even recall what the acronym, we're, we're worse than the government with our acronyms, I swear. Um, do they all start with but, WF? <laughs> I wish, it'd be at least easier to remember some of them. Uh, but I, I know that we do have... Uh, part of our team that has actually done some some analysis and some researching on uh ransom account stuff where we've done tracking of where payments are going um who's paying them um tracking back to you know receiving banks um you know unfortunately the those those trails go cold pretty quickly um and not not in the sense that we can't see, you know, that it went to this bank or whatever, but uh, it gets so clouded and, and we just, you know, we're, we're the bank. We don't have a lot of jurisdiction to, you know, compel uh, certain information um, and, you know, 
kind of like to Jason's point, you know, saying that the banks don't care in a, in a lot of cases like that, that's just true. I mean, it's, it's uh, depending on this, you know, the size, the, the scope of it. Um, it's just quicker. It's cheaper. It's easier to just, you know, pay someone, you know, whatever they've lost from you know, their stolen checks or whatever, uh, give them offer an, an apology and then just move on because, you know, we can't, again, we're, we're private and enterprise. We can't, you know, chase people down. We send all of that on, you know, it all gets, you know, submitted to, you know, FBI or secret service or whoever, you know, we've got, we've got regular standing meetings with all of those, you know, all of the agencies and law enforcement and everything uh, to come, kind of keep them apprised and contacts to, you know, who, who we need to call for this kind of thing. But basically we just tell them this is what happened and then we're, we're done with it. Um, Cause we can't, we can't go too much further than that. So, so for pe people listening um, a couple of things that we've run into <clears throat> as law enforcement uh, regarding the account ransom stuff is, one, one, one of them is someone is sending pic inappropriate pictures and all of a sudden a third party responds and says, hey, I now have access to these pictures. If you don't send me money, they're going to be shipped all over. And the other one is getting an, an email, which appears to be from your own account saying, hey, I'm a hacker. I took over your account. You need to pay me or I'm going to release whatever. Jason, how much, how much do you have to deal with that? We don't see a lot of that too often, thankfully. Uh, we've seen some of the the uh, the cyber sex type, you know. Uh, it's usually an underage person for us. Yeah, yeah. We we see we we see underage and married men. Mm. You know, uh, but. Even then, uh, we don't see a whole lot of that. It, it it trickles through, and it comes. It seems to come in waves. Uh, and it's been my experience also. It kind of depends on the amount of money that they're asking for too, mm -hmm. because a lot of times, uh, if it's a couple hundred bucks, the guys will just pay it. And so we had a family. They wound up doing that. Kid was super embarrassed, obviously. Because now he's now mom's involved. Mom knows what he did, and they wound up sending money. And I said, and I even before they did that, I said, okay, block them. No more communication. Don't do anything with them. Sure enough, they go and pay. And then they contact us again. They said, no, they're asking for more money. Okay, yeah. What well, did that's I, what did I tell you? And that's that's the slippery slope. Yeah. You know, uh, we've had several several cases of the you know, inheritance scam or the, mm -hmm. the, the Jamaican lottery, you know, yeah. where you got to pay your taxes. Oh, wait, we added it wrong. You owe us 5,000 more dollars. Oh, okay. Well now you need to pay, you know, the Jamaican taxes on it. And, oh, okay. Well now we need $10,000 to send to the IRS. Next thing the person knows they're, they're 30, 35, $40,000 in. Yep. And then the light bulb goes off. Yeah. Not uncommon. Yeah. And, uh, and, the sad reality is that money's overseas and it's gone for yes. the most part. Yes. Uh, now, the good news is, uh, and Lee brought this up earlier, if these, uh, so international wires, basically, if, if Secret Service is notified of an international wire soon enough, like almost it has to almost be immediately just before you hit send but if they are notified soon enough there is a way through fincen and treasury that they could possibly could possibly block it and get the money back cool uh yeah. now i i've i've seen it work two or three times i've seen it not work uh, a couple more times than that but it, it seems to be if if we know about it during a business day within the first couple of hours, we we can 
we can put the brakes on it and we can get that back. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. On, on, on that, you know, for international wires that can, the sooner, obviously it's reported, the better, um, it can depend. There can be some variations like time of day. You know, if I send it at 8 a.m., you know, mountain time and I'm sending it to a bank in, you know, Cairo where it's three in the morning, you've got some time because the wire hasn't cleared Swift yet, or it, it may not have. Swift can be holding it. It could be at the bank, but it's outside regular hours. So it hasn't processed yet. So it's possible. So, you know, if, if you think you've been a victim, contact your bank and say, look, someone sent a wire through my account. The bank can put a stop on it, try to claw it back. Um, it's unfortunately a lot of it is just depends on that receiving bank. If they get it and they see a note that says, we think this is fraudulent and they look at it and go, oh no, but I know that customer. It's okay. I'm going to give him his money anyway. Um, and these, these folks will set up at banks where they know that they can do that um, to make sure that that, that stuff's going to go through. Uh, it's absolutely possible to get it back, to, to, to claw it back or to stop the transaction from going through. But like Jason said, you just got to do it fast. I, yeah, and we, we dealt with a lot of people that, you know, they, oh, I'm embarrassed. Well, you know what? It's one thing to be embarrassed. It's a whole nother thing to be embarrassed and broke. Yeah. You know, it, it, we we can we can deal with embarrassment you now, but I, if I don't know about it, then we can't do anything about it, you know. And and we're I'm talking cases in you know a half a million dollars or more in some cases, you know. And yeah, okay, that's that that's pretty embarrassing to get duped out of you know a half a million dollars, but at least if you let us know right away, we may be able to do so. And it's amazing for us how quickly we get these calls. I, I, I hit send and realized I bought this. I yep. bought the, I bought these uh, gift cards. I hit send and then realized, so I called you right away. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's start the ball rolling. I wish you would have realized this just before you hit send. So, yeah. I, Looking at the organizational perspective, and, and I had hit on this a little bit earlier, but doing a, a deep inventory of the core critical services that we rely on and their operational capabilities as an organization to fight fraud, to fight cybercrime, is a really, really big deal. Um, we had an incident that actually involved some ransom where someone set up a server off of a cloud host. And from there, they were spoofing a local uh, area and just text messaging everybody as if they were from my financial institution. Hey, there was fraudulent activity on your account. Click this link to log in and we will uh, we'll get it taken care of. Standard, standard spiel, there were 500 things that every single impacted individual should have seen, but they didn't organizationally we got a tip off about this from a local do-gooder who allegedly gained access to the server that was being used for all of the text messages hosting the website as well as storing all of the compromised information i was able to determine within the first hour that we had all of this and that the hacker didn't know that we had it that is the best the best possible case for we know we have real addresses we have real credit card information we have real names organizationally we didn't have a pot of money that we could just throw away to let the fraud continue we didn't have uh sops in place to be able to contact local law enforcement and start to action that in the real world not just on the cyber side and we lost the best tip that we've had in the nearly two years that i've been with the institution because we just weren't ready to jump on it despite having a really good case if your organizations are not capable of responding in a meaningful time frame they are going to take all of the money that they're losing and they're getting it from you they're going to take 
every failing and they're passing it on to somebody, be it their customers, be it their client base, whatever, whatever, whoever. And they're putting your information at risk. Yeah, I'll say, you know, being with a much larger institution, um, and and this isn't specific to any one particular bank, um, when they get to a certain size, just like any other corporation, when you get to a certain size, the complexity just just layers up, you know. So if, you know, you're the bank teller and somebody comes in with a bunch of bad checks, I, you know, you report it to your supervisor who reports it to their manager, who reports it to their manager, who pulls out the incident reporting binder, who finds the number for security, who finds the number for somebody else. And all of a sudden it's four days later and you get an email back saying, okay, tell us what's happening. And you're like, well, I mean, the, it's gone. The person's gone. The money's gone. Uh, I can't do anything about it. Hate when that happens. Then it yeah. happens a lot. Yeah, it does. Again, we we are a little bit luckier here, I guess. You know, and we have some some fairly large institutions, but uh, through that relationship with the Bank of Security Association, yeah, you know, we hammered them with you have you have got to call us. Yeah. We the sooner we know, go. You know, if he's if there are guys in the lobby, we need to know. Yeah. If if you just if you're calling IT to let them know that you think you have somebody X filling money out of an account, the next call needs to be to us. You know, we we went as far as furnishing them a list of all of the task force officers by jurisdiction with their cell phones. You know, call me, text me. You have to let you have to let somebody know as soon as it starts, because like you said, four days later, they, it's gone. The money's gone. There's yeah. nothing we can do about it. You know, the damage, the damage is done it, at that point, you know, we're trying to plug holes, you know, and, and patch up, but the, the actual crime is, is over with, you know, and we can, we can do forensic examinations on servers and get that data, but, most of that stuff is going to be thrown into a database to be compared to crimes of a similar MO, you know, in the hope that down the road we get lucky and we stumble across somebody that has a laptop that has a Mac address that matches all these other cases so we can charge them. That's just the reality of it. You know, uh, at the end of the day, time is, time is money. So let's shift gears just slightly and talk about resources people can use. Now, obviously, with mo in most instances, you're if you do figure out, hey, I've been scammed or some form of fraud of has occurred, most likely your bank is going to want some form of a police report. Uh, the reporting officer may ask for printouts or copies, some form of documentation to add to the case. Ultimately, all you're looking for is going to be a case number. Um, but there are resources available um, one of the ones, especially when it comes to what was it like the, uh, the, like the sex crime, uh, ransom stuff. Uh, one of the things that we've been using is IC3.gov, yep. which is the FBI internet crime complaint center. Um, especially considering a lot of these things we aren't suspecting. Nope. It's not in our jurisdiction. We're going to need a, a larger entity to help, and that's that's been a resource for us to say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna start the report. We're gonna document everything we can. Start a report with these guys, um, and and go from there." Jason, what have you guys? What have what are the resources that you guys have provided or, or shared with? I see three. I see three is a great resource for stuff that uh, is large scope and scale. Right. So uh, actors that are operating overseas, you know, that are hitting tens of thousands of people a week. Uh, IC3 is is gathering all of that data 
and putting it in a database and there's analysts analyzing it. Uh, and again, in the hopes that at some point there's going to be a, a digital forensic examination done on a phone, on a server, on a computer, and your credit card number is going to come up, your account number is going to come up. And that's a way for the feds to build these giant cases and extradite people internationally and seize assets with foreign governments and try and legitimately get some form of justice. Uh, I've seen it happen. You know, I've, I've seen, ironically, Jamaican lottery perpetrators actually be extradited to the Eastern District of Louisiana and go to federal prison for 20 years. Awesome. Uh, it doesn't doesn't happen often, but I have seen it happen. Uh, and it's it's because of that raw data that's provided by the victims that goes to a team of analysts that actually turn it into actionable intelligence that we can bounce off of uh, forensics data in the field and in these field offices that we're, we're generating in these labs uh, to link all of these different actors together, you know, and identify massive amount of victims. And the reality is, is that you, you have to build a large multi-million dollar case in order to get these international extraditions and really get some time on these guys and shut them down. Uh, there's an aspect of this too, as, as the victim, don't assume that you're a singleton, that you're all by yourself and you're the only person targeted. We oh, had, a, yeah, we had a, an incident. Oh, it had to have been 10, 10, 15 years ago uh, involving a, a, what was it? Some kind of a scam and a couple people reported it. Turns out thousands of people were, were uh, taking advantage of it. They didn't know that they were taking advantage but it was because a couple people piped up and said, "Hey, this is kind of weird." There was an investigation, and sure enough, it, it was it was awesome. Uh, the as a matter of fact, I think my chief was he was part of the reason why it uh, it got uncovered. But uh, if you, I, I it's can... like you see something, say something. Financial oh, and scam stuff, yeah. And I could almost say with a ninety nine percent certainty that I have never seen a singular victim of a singular financial crime. Yeah, with nothing else related? No, that's not the way yeah. they operate. I mean, they're, they're, they're farming. They have to throw out this wide net. Exactly. And they're going to catch and it, someone. And it doesn't matter what the scheme is. It doesn't yeah. matter if, if it's... Uh, if it's a business email compromise, it doesn't matter if it's counterfeit checks, counterfeit currency, uh, card skimming. They're not just skimming one ATM. They're not just skimming yeah. one gas pump. They're not just washing uh, uh, enough dollar bills and reprinting them as hundreds to go to your local Walmart. They're yeah. going to every damn Walmart that they can find. You know, uh, so it, these things don't exist in a vacuum, which is where that that information and intelligence fed to IC3 really pays off in the end. Uh, one of the other resources that I really like to refer people to uh, when they've been victims is the Federal Trade Commission has a lot of great information on their website as far as uh, identity theft uh, mitigation for victims. Uh, one of the easiest things you can do really is download the the three credit bureau apps and and lock your credit mm, yeah yeah uh yeah you know, and and i went i went to a, a secret service sponsored training a couple of years ago and uh frank abagnale actually was was the keynote cool. speaker. yeah that's he did really a, cool he did a four-hour presentation and it, and it was really it was really cool to hear the the original gangster of financial crimes yeah really talk about how he did it and he started his presentation off and there's 120 secret service agents and task force officers from all over the country in this in this conference room and frank starts off by saying how many people here are 
are worried about getting their identity stolen and you know everybody's hand goes up and he's like how many people here have actually been a victim of identity theft and about half the room's hand goes up and i think this was before oh, yeah. the, uh, this was before the office of personnel management data breach yeah so uh frank and then frank kind of looks around and he goes all right everybody put your hands up everybody put your hands up so everybody kind of reluctantly puts their hands up and frank says well the good news is is that between china north korea russia and just general criminal enterprise your data your personal identifying information has been stolen several times over it just hadn't been used yet yeah you know and really the, to that end the only thing you really can do is monitor yeah yeah but there's some there's some simple things that that i like to tell people first of all checks are the devil you know, uh, for a street level financial crime perpetrator, checks are the easiest thing for him to do. Yeah, we had a huge case going on for several years during COVID down here uh, in the New Orleans metro area where they were stealing entire mailboxes and going through them and pulling the checks out. They weren't even, they weren't even counterfeiting the checks they were just uh altering them and trying to cash them and it if you're gonna mail a check go inside the post office you know we've seen them stolen out of people's mailboxes we've seen them stolen out of drive up mailboxes uh you know and you, you said earlier these crimes don't just affect the elderly and that's true but we see a disproportionate amount of victims of check fraud that are elderly. That's because they're the only ones using checks nowadays. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't had a check in in probably ten years. I know? don't know where my checkbooks are. I think they were stolen. Yeah, but that yeah. that being, but part part of it was paranoia too. You know, where you work financial crimes long enough, and all you want to do is use cash. So, yeah, I mean, I, I know we've we've got people. You know, we, we've spent so much time, I mean, we're doing a whole podcast on, you know, financial crime and cybersecurity and stuff like that. But, you know, there are so many people getting into this world now, into this profession, who've probably never written a check, who don't yeah. know, don't know what a, a washed check might look like. They've never seen, you know, a, a forged signature. They don't have any idea. And so those things just, they just get by them. And unfortunately, you know, it's a lot of, you know, frontline teller folks who just take these checks in because they don't know, all they know is, you know, the 30 minutes of, of training that they got on how to spot this stuff. And then two weeks later, it shows up in our repository and we look at it and go, this is the fakest thing I've ever seen. Like, yeah. how did this get through? It's like, well, you know, this, we've just had people who don't know what to look for you know they can spot fraud in wires all day long because that's electronic and it's on a computer yeah. but, but they've never seen check a check in, in real life yeah you put a check in front of them and they're like what are what are all these numbers at the bottom is that how much the check is for like, yes you, yeah you can just use my name that is in fact okay <laughs> so, so the other thing if you're gonna write a check and not i don't know if my camera will focus in on this but that's a, a uniball 207 so this is the only pen available on the market that the ink is not washable from a check. Oh, and they it put that actually, on their packaging, right? Yeah. Well, in it's this, on their this, packaging. Yeah. And this this ink was actually invented by Frank Abagnale. <laughs> of course, it was one of, yes. one of his patents. <laughs> I don't know if you can see him. That's that's me and Frank a couple yep. of years ago. That's cool. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I met him at a conference also. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have I have boxes of those pens. That's the only pen that I will allow in my home. Nice. You know? And I don't even write I don't even write checks, but you know, you, you do this long enough and you you get a little paranoid. Although yes. <laughs> although some of the old uh old Vietnam Marines I used to hang out with would would say that there's no such thing as paranoia, only a heightened sense of awareness. <laughs> so Frank Ab Abagnale has been mentioned a couple times. Uh, the movie Catch Me If You Can <laughs> documents, and it's entertaining. I, I really genuinely enjoyed that movie. Um, 
it, it will give you the backstory if, if you don't know who this is. Yep. He's the original fraudster. Yeah. Legitimately. Yeah. Yeah. And then kind of one other thing that, you know, and I've done it, caught myself doing it a few times is don't save your credit card information on websites. That's, that's just, uh, and some, some businesses have a higher level of security, but at the end of the day, you don't know what their level of security is. So better safe than sorry. If they get, they get hacked, you know, the AT&T breach is a prime example. You know, we don't know what the level, we'd like to think that a a corporate entity as large as AT&T has a pretty robust uh, security protocol surrounding at least their, their payment system, but we don't know. So there's a possibility if you're, if your bank card was saved in that database, then it's up for sale on a dark web. And it's only a matter of time before somebody buys it and makes a little card out of it, a platinum card, That's right. you know, and goes and buys them some gift cards or some new shoes, you know. At Walmart. So, yeah. 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 And if if you're using, you know, your app for your, your Capital One Visa or whatever, um, get... You, you can get, you know, one-time numbers. You can get one-time card numbers just, you know, before you make a payment on a website, just go in to the app, have it generate a number for you, use that. It's, you know, it's still going to charge it to your card, whatever, but the number you're giving them is not actually your card. Good stuff. Well, unfortunately, I think it's the time has come for us to close. Absolutely fantastic discussion. Um, what we're going to now is uh, final thoughts and plugs. If you have anything that you want to plug, anything you want to plug. Um, and again, my favorite phrase or my favorite thing to say, support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. These guys have shared some awesome information. This is one of those episodes where I, I honestly, I'm going to be half tempted to tell people when they report fraud, hey, watch this. Now, that might not be the best thing. But I'm definitely going to share it with friends and family because I think there's a lot of value with what we discussed. Um, This is stuff that affects everyone. And the insights shared tonight were absolutely fantastic. And it won't take that big of a change in your lifestyle to incorporate some of these safety measures. So with that in mind, Lee, final thoughts, plugs? Be skeptical. Be critical. Yeah. Yeah. If you are under the influence, don't touch this thing, because that is the the one time that I got got was sitting there drunk, having just downloaded Tinder on a rough day. Um, every single scam is playing to playing into an emotional bias. Yes, yes. Remove their ability to do so. Um, otherwise, the only thing that I've got is Matt. I want you to know that you named this episode incorrectly it should be your money is insured by the federal government you won't lose a dime i think that's a little too long of a title (laughs) the reality is there is complacency left right and center in this field because nobody's losing any money yeah because the federal reserve goes and prints out a bunch more and nobody cares you're the only person who can care about your financial well-being, and I hope that we've given uh, some topics to start investigating. Yeah. Now, something that you just said, I think it brought up a, an idea that I was thinking of earlier, and it's what you said about being skeptical. This is just like your own personal self-defense. If something in the back of your mind is going, hey, wait, wait, red flag, red flag, pay attention to that. And if you're getting this phone call or you get this email or text, uh, be skeptical, just like what Lee said. Awesome. Thank you. Barry? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest takeaway, you know, as far as protecting yourself uh, from this kind of stuff is just what was said earlier. You know, if if it seems too good to be true, it is, um, you know, slow down, think about what's what's being asked of you, of what you're being asked to do or provide or whatever. Um if you know you get that random phone call or that text message from your bank, just hang up and call your local branch. Um, that's that's just 
it's a simple thing to do. Um, but I think too many people just, it, just like Lee said, it's the emotion. They get caught up in it. Jason, you know, example earlier also freak out like, oh no, I have to do this right now or yeah. something bad's going to happen. So uh, just take a breath, you know, take a beat and, uh, and walk through it. Good stuff. Jason? Uh, like Lee and Barry said, think once it's gone, it's gone. You know, uh, especially with the larger stuff for the business, uh, small business owners, but you have an obligation to your customer to do things right and to protect their information. Uh, you know, and be that financial information or personal identifying information. That's a responsibility that your customer has handed over to you. Uh, so you need to make sure that that electronic data is being properly and safely stored and that it's secure. And there are there are plenty of private entities out there that specialize in that stuff. Uh, it'll cost you a little bit on the front end, but it'll definitely save you some heartache in the long end because it's only a matter of time before they come after you. Yeah. Everybody here, any, everybody that watches this, we all have been victims. We've all had attempts. We all could name countless friends and family members that have been victims. This isn't anything that's going away. This is the uh, entrepreneurship of criminal enterprise coming yeah. full circle. Yeah. When you think about it, why do people rob banks? For money. Why do people sell drugs? For money. Why do people steal stuff? Because they can't buy it. Financial crimes cuts out all of that. They're going straight to the source. And unfortunately, with technology and uh, the fast paced increase lifestyles that everybody's living, you know, we're getting less attentive, less situationally aware in not just this aspect, but certain other you know, plenty of other aspects, you need to take a breath, like Barry said. Take a breath, slow down. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. You need to protect your money because nobody else is going to do it for you. Awesome. Awesome discussion. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, I look forward to this getting out and, and being able to share it. The next episode getting released is going to be uh, kind of the sequel to our uh, our major shotgun episode uh the following week this one will be released yeah the stuff we discussed today it's not guns gear it's not all the sexiness and all that but it's important and i'm glad we were able to discuss it um if anyone listening or watching has more stuff they'd like to have covered similar to this just reach out to me matt at primary and um or message me on facebook it could this could easily we could easily reassemble this panel and continue on and, and cover some adi uh, additional aspects of it because yeah, this stuff isn't going away. It's also not new. So yeah, great stuff. Uh, big thanks to the sponsors. Big thanks to uh, big Tech's ordinance, overwatch precision, Filster, primary arms, Walther. And lastly, big thank you to the Patreon subscribers. Um, the Patreon subscribers do have access to watching these live as they occur they have the ability to post questions. We can address it live. It may even make the show. Um, if you want to help support the network, go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary. Uh, from there, there are multiple tiers and uh, it starts at a dollar a month. If primary and secondary has helped you out, uh, consider doing a little bit of support. It's definitely appreciated. All of this costs and the costs isn't just money. It's also time. And man, this takes some time, but I am beyond excited that I can uh, provide stuff like this because this is, ultimately this is free. No one's going to have to pay to get this information, listen to this or get the advice. And I'm try, I try to make our episodes uh, worth your time. So I believe our next episode, which is number 357, also known as 357, I kind of texted a couple people. It's probably going to be a revolver episode. I'm sorry. Um, I think that's pretty much everything. Uh, again, awesome discussion. And I, I, I really appreciate you guys coming out and, and, and talking. Um, this was actually an episode we 
discussed it a few months ago and something got my attention, got me thinking, oh, we probably need to do that episode. I don't remember what it was, but I'm glad we were able to get together. And then Lee decided to jump on. Oh, she wasn't invited. But that's all. Um, yeah, we'll have more of these for you. Just uh, stay tuned. We'll talk to you later.